again and welcome to Trends in Marketing with Dr. Jag Desheth, the award-winning professor of marketing at Emory University. My name is John Christensen. I'm the host and moderator for this series. Today, Dr. Sheth offers a unique consumer-oriented perspective called the four A's of marketing. Rather than simply marketing products, Dr. Sheth believes that companies should create value for their customers by finding exactly what they want and need. That means not only making sure that customers are aware of the products, but also assuring that the products are affordable, acceptable, and accessible. As usual, at the conclusion of his presentation, Dr. Sheff will answer questions. And now, here's Dr. Sheff. Thank you very much for that very nice introduction, John. I'm very excited to make this presentation. It is a new framework that I created about seven or eight years ago. We have done lots of research on this framework. A colleague of mine, Dr. Rai Sisodia, I, and I are right now writing a book on this particular framework. And the reason for this excitement is that I believe marketing as a practice and as a discipline needs a new perspective. The new perspective is called the four A's of marketing. And that is basically a customer perspective. Marketing got organized not as much around customers as around resources, what we call the four P's of marketing. And if you look at it, the marketing primarily was organized during the days when we had to create new markets. In other words, people were doing things at home. They were making it rather than buying in the marketplace and as the agricultural age began to fade away with the rise of the industrial revolution and industrial age or mass marketing, mass manufacturing, people began to outsource lots of activities they did at home. Let's just call it cooking, cleaning, etc. And the number of products that came into existence because of the industrial revolution, especially the process technologies, the packaging technologies, so we could make what are perishable product last longer on the shelf. And at that time, marketing as a practice in the discipline got organized primarily to create markets, which means the whole objective of marketing was how do we create new customers? Even today, marketing is practiced as if we are still creating new customers, except today, the 21st century reality, 100 years or so later now, primarily is more and more a mature market. Markets are no longer, in fact, new market creations. New market creation is still very valuable practice, but in emerging nations like China, India, Brazil, Russia, etc., but not in advanced countries. So now what we need is a new perspective that has nothing to do with really creating new markets except for altogether new industries maybe, but majority of the products vast number of customers are already existing customers. So the new framework has to do, in fact, with customer retention, customer loyalty, and that stuff. And therefore, the traditional framework called four P's of marketing, which is product, place, promotion, and uh, uh, you know, price, is not going to be as useful is my one major contention. Second reason is that we have also seen more and more in the last at least 20 years marketing does not deliver value to the corporation. We are spending enormous amount of advertising dollars, promotion dollars, for example, direct marketing dollars, telemarketing, now the web-based spam and all the stuff we are doing, and the returns are just not coming together as well. Mainly, again, the reason is that if it was a new market creation, the returns will be very high. You will be making people aware and therefore, they'll be interested in switching from making to buying. But today, people already know those products. So most of them looks like junk mail, as we call it. It is junk calls, junk mails, junk spam. All the stuff is called junk by the customers or by the market because they don't see any value of being informed properly, educated properly. So the productivity of marketing resources is going down enormously, for example. The new product introductions are getting harder and harder. The failure rate is enormous. Even after doing market tests and all that stuff, all the pre-testing, all the market research, new product failure is still more than 50% of new products fail in the marketplace. 
unless they are altogether new products, such as the cell phones, for example, or an iPod now, etc. But other than that, most of the innovation is sort of a me too. Most of the innovation is a slight improvement, and customers are simply not willing to change from what they are buying right now to the new product, by and large. Or if it succeeds, it's mostly a migration path. In other words, the previous generation of product with a brand is able to migrate the customers to the new generation, as we see in computers, for example, like the, you know, the Intel chips 286, 386, 486, or the servers, the new generation of servers, for example, or the new generation of software, for example, or the new generation of toothpaste, like Colgate coming out with a total, which is an added protection against gingivitis. That's about all we can see as an output. So a lot of new product failure is out there, which is a massive expense to the society. So we just say same thing about not only failure of you know, new products, but failure of new campaigns. Very few campaigns really get the excitement of the people. In fact, today we have on the American football called the Super Bowl Day, people watch the Super Bowl to see what are the new commercials will come about Companies pay millions of dollars for half a minute or a minute of time, and most of them fail. A few commercials only get excitement, and obviously these are like the, the best of the best commercials companies produce, ad agencies produce, and offer it to the marketplace as a test ground, and unfortunately that does not work very well either. Let's talk about the promotional things. Last year in this country, for example, we sent out more than four billion, B as in boy, not million, more than four billion invitations to 120 million consumers, pre-approved, pre-authorized credit card invitations. And it does not work. How are companies go ahead and do it because the way they calculate the financial return is primarily to say, so long as my revenues that I generate incremental is more than the cost, incremental cost that I do for a campaign, I'm okay. So the yield may be half a percent, quarter percent, but they don't think about 99% or more than 99% is all waste to the company, waste to the society, irritation in the society, etc. And that's the problem of marketing productivity crisis. It is not that marketing does not de uh, deliver the return on investment. In fact, I'm very opposed to calculating ROI of marketing dollars just for that reason, because I can always show that with a massive shotgun approach, I can produce some impact, but is it worth doing it? Are we going to irritate the society? Are we going to bring more regulation, for example? And is it the smartness of management? I don't buy that argument, that it is a smart management. I think anybody can, through shotgun approach, by simply throwing darts in the, on the board, or in fact, just in fact doing a you know, random call, you will get some return anyhow. Just because the cost of marketing, mass marketing is going down, especially with the internet, does not mean that we are actually more effective and even more efficient in the process. So that's my second point, that the traditional marketing has failed to generate the kinds of excitement, the kind of return that we were used to, mainly because market is no longer an emerging market in America or in advanced countries, but the market is a mature market, and they're already saturated. The third main reason why marketing as a discipline and as a practice needs a new framework is all about internal marketing. Marketing used to be invited at the table of the senior most management discussion or at the board meetings. When you have altogether new industry being created, like the dot-com phenomenon, high-tech things, you may create a better mousetrap, but everybody knows without marketing, it's not going to happen. There will be no market. You must make customers aware, you must custom make uh, find value for the, uh, for the product in the customer's mind. You must, in fact, motivate the customers. Uh, therefore, in a startup in, in industry or in a startup company, marketing is still very valuable. But as the industries have matured, especially packaged goods industries, the traditional approach to marketing anchored around four Ps of marketing is becoming marginalized more and more. 
In fact, I've given a challenge to my colleagues in practice to say, show me a single initiative in the last 25, 30 years that a chief marketing officer gave to the CEO that he got excited about. Please remember, customer satisfaction did not come from marketing organization. Malcolm Baldridge Award came from the TQM quality management process, which had nothing to do with marketing. Six Sigma had nothing to do with marketing. Interestingly, in fact, even the brand equity that we believe is a part of marketing domain, the concept of the intangible asset came from finance guys and investment bankers, not from marketing people. I've tried very hard to find a single initiative that a chief marketing officer brought to the table in board discussions, and I sit on the boards of public companies, and I have not found anything that has excited the board members or the CXX in the organization or the CEO of the organization. So marketing is getting marginalized within the companies. How do we re revitalize marketing is another thing. My view is that it needs a new framework, and we will show you that framework today in my presentation. And the last area is that marketing got organized historically, as it should have been very rightfully, a product oriented. In other words, I have created a product. Now I need to somehow package the product, position the product. Remember, these are the traditional marketing thoughts. I need to target market the right segment so I get more alignment between a market need and my product. And then I do advertising promotion in a business to business market, a sales organization to basically motivate the customers to buy my product. So marketing got very rightfully organized around a product. But today, product is not the driver of markets. It is the market who is the driver of products, essentially. It is what we call reverse marketing, essentially. In fact, if you look at today's consumption and the procurement, 90 to 95% of what people consume and buy is what they bought yesterday, last week, last month, last year. Whether those are appliances like refrigerators, uh, range, or it is uh, microwave ovens, I don't care, any one of the appliances, or grocery products, or a Dell computer, which is why companies like Dell Computers have basically created a e-commerce platform which says customers will order on their own and based upon that we will build it in the factory. So is Cisco Systems the same way. Most of their, therefore, the marketing is now market driven or demand driven and we need to therefore have a new framework in the process by and large. So we'll go into that discussion as we go into the new framework, okay? So what is four days of marketing? Let's define that and then get into more specifics about the four A's of marketing. It is primarily a customer perspective as opposed to a product perspective. That's the fundamental difference. And if marketing is defined as taking the market view or customer view, then this is the approach that makes more sense as opposed to four P's of marketing, which is really a managerial uh, resource approach not how that resource will make an impact in the marketplace. Again, if you're going to work back from the market or customer perspective, as we talked about earlier, how everything is becoming reverse marketing in mature markets, we need to take a customer perspective. So that's what it is all about. It is based on three dis dis distinct values that customers seek in the marketplace, based upon three roles a typical customer plays. A customer is a buyer, and therefore he's, he or she is going to look for, in fact, the convenience, the availability, the access primarily. So I call it as accessibility as a value customer is seeking. A customer is also a payer, and as a payer, he's going to look at the affordability aspects by and large. And we will define each one of these A's in a little more detail a little later on. A customer is also a user, and therefore, acceptability, as I call it, would be the third A. These three roles are the fundamental roles of a customer in the marketplace. In the marketing literature, we have never divided a customer into the specific roles the customer plays, except maybe in business-to-business -business marketing. 
In business to business marketing, it is very obvious. You have the procurement department in charge of purchasing, for example. You have the engineering department in charge of the user, the production side, by and large. And you have the finance department in charge of payments. And therefore, in B2B marketing, we always have called a decision-making by the customers as decision-making unit. Three clear roles, and then we add the role of an influencer, a gatekeeper, and a decision-maker. In consumer markets, because we always think about consumer as the individual rather than as a household, we don't think about separating the three roles. At a household level, it makes perfect sense because a child would be just a user but not a payer or a buyer. In many cases, the buyer may be somebody else like a teenage son or a daughter who lives at home and does all the procurement but does not have the budgeting uh, you know, uh, control or a budgeting authority. That is in the hands of the parents and more and more in the hand of the homemaker, essentially, or whoever is the chief operating officer of an institution called the household now. I think we have to really understand, even as an individual consumer where I have all three roles under me, I still have to have those debates in my mind. A product may be very acceptable, but it's not affordable to me. Automobiles is a classic example. Homes are classic examples. Cameras are classic examples. We can just go on thinking about a bunch of products which may be very acceptable, very desirable, but not affordable. Or the product may be affordable as well as acceptable, but unfortunately access is a problem because the product is made someplace in a foreign country and I have no access, for example. The distribution comes in the way. So I'm anchoring the whole thing into ultimately three A's are fundamentals. So what about the fourth A? Well, in order for me as a customer to understand the value a product offers as a user to me, as a payer to me, as a buyer to me, I need to have a knowledge. So I have coined the fourth A as awareness. Fourth A is somewhat unique or different in the sense that it is awareness, which means I have a knowledge about the product category, knowledge about the brands, knowledge about the different attributes, and that is all around all three A's by and large. You will see a model later on that I will show you where all fours have to work synergistically to create value in the marketplace by and large. So the role of marketing is to create markets by delivering equally on all four A's, and I will show that as a formula later on. Marketing can use traditional marketing resources as well as several non-traditional and non-marketing resources. Other reason why marketing has not delivered the value to the corporation is that it primarily utilizes the resources given to it as a part of its budgeting process, what is what we call the four P's of marketing. But marketing has enormously other resources in the organization, such as the R&D resources, such as the, uh, you know, the, the, the company affairs or publicity affairs people uh, you know, as, as a resource, for example. It has a resource in terms of logistics people. All other non-marketing functions could be easily resources that marketing can, by doing internal marketing, access those and deliver to the marketplace to create these four A's of marketing value as we talked about. And of course, marketing has lots of non-traditional resources like word of mouth communication. Like, for example, using customers as advocates. We'll again show you more detail about all this stuff. So this is the fundamentals of four A's of marketing. Let's define each A of marketing. But before I do that thing, let's talk about how does a company could develop markets or create markets. Market value coverage, as I call it, which is the measure we can say, how much market value can I create and have I saturated that coverage, is a function of four things. How much market awareness have I created as a marketer? How much market accessibility have I provided? How much market affordability have I provided? And how much market acceptability have I created? You need to create values for all four A's in order to create a market coverage, by and large. Markets don't make trade-offs is my fundamental message. In other words, a customer does not want to say, just because the product is better, I'm willing to pay more price. That's what we think. 
That's what the marketers would like to do, but customers would rather actually have a superior product at a lower price in a customer-friendly manner, which is the accessibility. If I can do that thing, I will always win the market. So customers don't make trade-offs. My view is that only managers make trade-offs. Managers do. The best managers, therefore, are those who refuse to accept that trade-off. In other words, best managers are those who say, how can I deliver a superior product at a lower price in a accessible manner? And by the way, the company that actually thought like that is a company called Coca-Cola Company. I'm told in my archival research and my, by my friends that Coca-Cola actually had three A's of marketing as a fundamental principle around which it organized the whole company. Every job in the company, whether it was a lawyer's job, whether it was an accountant's job, it was a marketer's job, production job, bottler's job, was how do we make Coca-Cola more acceptable, more affordable, and more available, as they call it. So they call it three A's of marketing as affordability, availability, acceptability. So, and this is a model that is basically a reflection of the same thing with a fourth A that I have added. Generally, most industries know how to create market acceptability and market awareness. Remember my earlier comment that startup companies, altogether new industries, you create a better mousetrap, which is the market acceptability. In fact, all the literature on innovation says that the best successful innovations were actually created by frustrated users who said, I can do better than anybody else is doing in the marketplace. They had an engineering talent, an inventor's talent, a discoverer's talent, whatever it is, and came out with a better mousetrap, as we call it. So acceptability was always focused as a way of entering into the marketplace. And as I mentioned again, startup companies always think about creating markets, so awareness also was emphasized heavily. How do I do publicity? How do I, in fact, use uh, you know, the local media primarily to make people aware that I exist? So awareness and acceptability have been generally, in fact, primary focus of what most companies have done. But most companies are not as good, in fact, in creating two additional values, which is affordability and accessibility. So in general, as a generalization, most companies may be very good in acceptability, which is all engineering, R&D, innovation we talked about, very good about awareness, advertising, promotion, publicity, and all this stuff, but they are not really as good, in fact, in making sure product is available everywhere, at any time, any location, or that the product, in fact, would be affordable to as large a population as possible. In my other presentations, I have made a comment, and I strongly believe that this 200 or more years of industrial revolution and all the benefits mankind has experienced. Think about our life today and the life 1800 years, uh, in 1800s, for example. How life is more simplified, more convenient, uh, is only experienced by 15% of the world population. 85% of the world population has never experienced, in fact, the benefits of the Industrial Revolution. Even today, more than 50% of the people have never made a single telephone call, let alone having a cell phone of their own or access to a telephone line. More than 50% of the world population has never experienced benefits of electricity. More than 80% of the people have no running water, let alone hot and cold water combination that we take it for granted. Just goes on and on and on. And that is because the technology we diffused and made successful products has been primarily technology designed for markets that can afford rather than designing market or technologies and products that markets cannot afford, essentially. So affordability has become the hot topic now. There is a book out by C.K. Prahalad, who actually shows you that bottom of the pyramid, which, which is where the masses are, there is a huge business opportunity in a positive way, a win-win, 
in having served that poor of the society by and large, people below a poverty level, people who earn $1 a day kind of a revenue or $2 a day kind of a revenue, and you can still create enormous markets out of those uh, companies, by and large, or those markets, if the companies are smart how to do it. But that will require a totally different way of innovating than the traditional way we have innovated. And the same thing, the traditional distribution channels, the traditional way we access those customers may not be appropriate. So again, to repeat this point, and I'm repeating quite heavily to emphasize that while we know how well to do acceptability and awareness, what we really don't know how well to do in marketing is affordability and accessibility. Therefore, mass market cre creation requires a special focus toward market affordability and market accessibility. That's the fundamental message in four A's of marketing that I'm going to bring in. Now let's talk about the definitions of each one of the A's. Let's take awareness. But before I go into the definition, I want to point out that we have tried to dimensionalize, my colleague and I, into two dimensions. Each one of these the four A's will have primarily two dimensions. Each one of these dimensions would have several attributes or measurement scales that we can create. I do believe that ultimately I can be no more than three dimensions and I can pretty much summarize all of the variance as it is called or the differences among people's views or market views among these three dimensions. I've done a lot of statistical work and I've shown that if you do an orthogonal polynomial of a function, then basically you have the linear, you have the square, you have the cubic function, and that explains all the variation in a given phenomenon. So I become a strong advocate of what I call a rule of three. The world revolves around number three. Everything is three, but here we are going to talk about two dimensions primarily to simplify. Although I do believe two dimensions capture maybe 90 to 90 percent of whatever our objectives are in delivering each one of the four A's. So awareness. The extent to which consumers are informed regarding the product characteristics, persuaded to try the product, brand or a product, and if applicable, remind them to repurchase it. That's all about awareness. As I mentioned, it has two dimensions we have created. The first dimension is brand knowledge which can be measured by aided recall, unaided recall, brand associations, product characteristics, top of the mind. These are all research techniques that marketing uses all the time. But basically, how do we create brand knowledge? That's the awareness area. Second category, or second dimension is product knowledge, where you have a whole category interest. Do consumers even have an interest in the product category such as, for example, diet products, diet drinks, diet foods, low carbs. Those are all categories. Familiarity with those products, product categories. Involvement with product categories. Competitive reviews, comparing this category with other category. It is all about product level, not a brand level knowledge that we are talking about, and how much it is personally relevant to me. That's what we call as a product uh, knowledge or a product awareness. So you have a brand awareness and a product awareness. We call it knowledge rather than awareness to generalize pretty much to a more deeper level of understanding. And my definition of accessibility is the following. The extent to which customers are able to readily acquire and use the product. And by the way, when I use the word product, it is product or service, but it's very hard to repeat again product or service all the time, so I'm just going to use product as a generic term. Again, it has two dimensions. The first dimension is availability, and availability is a function of supply versus demand. Always supply and demand are not in a sync. In fact, there's a very classic paper written by Professor Philip Cutler, who is probably the best thinker in marketing today, Philip Cutler is like this, uh, you know, Paul Samuelson of marketing, essentially. His textbook is a very popular textbook, but he wrote a classic paper about the tasks of marketing management as demand management. 
The notion was that supply and the demand will, will be always out of sync, and what can a marketer do to shape the market so that it is in consistency with the supply, which you could not change in the short run. That was the thinking primarily. So for example, if the demand is latent but not overt, you have a product ready, how do you convert latent demand into an overt demand? If the demand is negative because the product has a negative image, and we know many products which have negative image, like prunes, like in fact uh, products that we avoid in some fashion for whatever reason, social taboos, or we feel products are dangerous, whatever it is, how do you make negative products positive, create a demand out of that one? Of course, the most obvious one would be seasonality. Products are available only certain season, but other seasons products are sitting there on the shelf when there's no season behind. People buy it during seasonality, like I need you know, winter products because the winter is here. I need summer gardening products because summer is here. So the rest of the time, the product sits in the inventory. And he articulated a bunch of things like that, including, for example, demarketing that actually it is in the interest of the industry and the company to de-emphasize what the consumers are buying and consuming, or such as, for example, many of the taboo products or products the society believes ought to be consumed in moderation, like the wine, the spirits, the alcohol, the beer, or cigarette smoking, for example. Very interesting framework. That is the supply versus demand management. We also have the whole issue of the product in stock. Is it on the shelf or not? Many, many times in my research I find at retail location, the product is not on the shelf, it is in the back office. Customer comes, most of that is self-service now at stores like Kmart, Sears, Walmart, etc. The product may be sitting in the back room, but it is not on the shelf. It's a minor tactical thing, but the customer sees it is out of stock and walks away. So the demand and the supply didn't match again, right? Uh, the assortment that the customer is looking may not be available. Specific variety they are looking for by size, color, whatever it is. Uh, related products and services, for example, if they want to buy together in some fashion, and the related products may not be available at the time and the place the customers are looking for. There may be a peak usage capacity seasonality that I talked about, especially Christmas time. Uh, is a very big seasonal issue in most countries, especially in advanced economies, where the uh, season for Christmas now begins in America all the way in the month of November, for example. So November and December are very peak shopping time periods in consumer markets. In business to business, we have a similar peak. It's called the fourth quarter syndrome. Last quarter of my fiscal year, I want to spend that money. So I buy accordingly, whether it's a government buying, government budget, their fiscal year, or it is the typical corporate fiscal year, which in America ends usually on December 31st, and in most of the rest of the world, it always ends in March 31st, for example. So last quarter, always there's a huge demand surge. How do we meet the demand? So availability is one dimension. Second dimension is convenience. It basically emphasizes time utility of the customer that we can create value, the place utility of the customer, value-added services that, can, that I can add so that can I be helpful to the customer when they are shopping in a store, for example? Can I do consultative selling, as it is called in business-to-business -business market? Easy to find within and across locations. Often I find product is right there on the shelf staring at me and I don't see it. Especially if it is an unfamiliar brand I'm buying for the first time or an unfamiliar product category in a store that I visit regularly. I don't know where that product category is housed within the store. And today now we have these mega stores, super stores, so the number of product categories are enormous out there. Number of brands also may be very large. So those are the kinds of things we are talking about. Convenience goes not strictly at the shopping place, but the convenience also eventually we'll talk about in the usage, like the sizes of the packages, you know, can I store it right, etc. Once I bring it home, can I lift it properly from the store to my car? Is it possible to bring from car to my home minor details in packaging and provide enormous convenience, in other words? Those are the two dimensions of what I call accessibility.
and lots of examples are out there and we'll get into specifics how to create these values when we get into that one we'll show you what marketing practice actually can deliver these values with some specific examples uh, the third one has to do with affordability as i mentioned this is a very key thing to, to think about affordability means the extent to which customers in the target market are willing as well as able uh, to pay the price being asked for by the product, by the company. Not that price around includes more than the price I pay. It includes all the hidden costs, for example, financing, sales tax, whatever the taxes are. You know, I'm always amused about uh, the hotel bills, as we all travel a lot. And you believe that you are actually, in fact, uh, paying a given price per night of stay. When you check out, you get a bill which is 20 25%, 30%. In some countries, 40% high. It has probably luxury tax in some countries. It has a value-added tax because you are a, a visitor, a tourist in that country. It has city tax. It has entertainment tax. It has all kinds of taxes. And suddenly, I get a shock, and I get disappointed. So the price includes those hidden costs, as we call it. Price also includes, in many product categories, the lifetime of usage of the product. So for example, in automobile, it is not the purchase price, but also the repair maintenance, also the gasoline that I pay, the license fees, it goes on, all those taxes, which are annual add-on purchasing cost by and large, or what we call life cycle costing. Appliances the same way. In fact, in my analysis during the energy crisis of the 70s, I found that in refrigerators, over the life of 12 years of a refrigerator, more than 50 to 60% of the total cost is not the purchase price, but it is the cost of operating the refrigerator. We calculate all this in a business to business, business market very easily. Because there, a machinery is actually an economic uh, uh, you know, activity. It generates revenue. And therefore, we measure that as a cost center. And we calculate all of those things. Taxi people realize that they have an energy cost daily, for example, repair maintenance cost. They have to pay license fees, all that stuff by and large. In household market, however, customers are now getting more educated by consumer advocates and by government agencies to think about not only the price you are paying, but the total cost of using, buying, consuming the product by and large, OK? And also, by the way, there's a third element of the cost that is built into our thinking, namely that there may be the cost of switching cost, as we call it, which means I bought a product, let's say a house. I have to maintain the house. I have to pay mortgage. I have to pay insurance. But when I want to sell the house, I will have an exit cost because I have to pay the broker a percent of the commission. So we have to add all that cost, by and large. The underlying, there are two dimensions here. One has to do with ability to pay. And ability to pay primarily is anchored in consumer products toward the total income, which you get it from the wages, as well as your net worth, by and large, which is your balance sheet. Ability to pay for corporations is the same way. What are their earnings and what is their balance sheet? It's the same concept between B2B market and consumer market. I think we have exaggerated this difference between B2B market and consumer markets. I find more similarity between the two. The second aspect is willingness to pay. And willingness to pay comes from perceived price value. In other words, am I paying the price which is fair compared to the value I'm getting or better than fair? So fairness aspect comes in, value aspects comes in. What are my alternative choices that I have in terms of my willingness to pay? And will I be making any trade-offs? So those are the dimensions that we have uh, think thought about, about ability to pay and willingness to pay under affordability. Next area has to do with acceptability. Acceptability is the extent to which the company's total product offering meets or exceeds customer expectations as a user primarily. And there are two dimensions of a user acceptability. First one is strictly functional acceptability. Does the product offer the capability that it promises? It does what it says it's going to do. It meets my need, it meets my want, it meets my desire. Whatever I'm looking for is my expectation. 
how easy it is to use, for example, is the product having quality assurance? Does it have reliability? In fact, reliability has become a major issue recently because of the TQM philosophy and companies like Toyota actually are becoming runaway success in the marketplace by building reliability, engineering reliability into their product design. And compared to the rest of the world, Toyota products, Honda products do far better, at least in the perception of the customers, for example. Those are the very key issues. Design is another issue, experience is another issue, and we'll again get into some details when we talk about how marketing can create these values or influence the customers in general. The second aspect has to do with psychological value. You know, these are perceived values above and beyond what could be engineered in the marketplace. And the psychological acceptability has to do with uh, social association of the product or the brand with a given socioeconomic class or with a given personality, for example, like a show business personality, a sports personality, the Michael Jordan phenomenon when it comes to, you know, Nikes or athletic wear or Tiger Woods phenomenon, as we call it, when the product is associated with an endorsement made by a person that I identify, that I respect, that gives me a quality assurance, an image assurance. Emotional value is bundled into the uh, psychological acceptability. Emotional value says, does the product bond me emotionally, my emotional needs, my emotional wants, my emotional desires, whatever you call them. And the last one, and a very key concept in a psychological acceptability is to, is to basically the notion of a risk I'll be taking. In marketing, we have not really utilized the concept of consumers shopping, consumers buying, especially consuming, to avoid risk. Consumers are not risk takers. They are basically risk avoiders in some fashion. So how do they minimize the risk? And you have, obviously, the physical risk that you can encounter if the product is unsafe, especially edible product, the one that you eat, for example, or physical products like automobiles or baby strollers, whatever they are, physical uh, risk. Product may not perform as well as we think, which is called the performance uncertainty. You may have an economic risk by buying the wrong product, such as automobile or home, immediately automobile depreciates so fast. In home, you have to pay the broker, and therefore there's no return. You will have some losses immediately. You can also have, in fact, significant amount of economic risk in uh, appliances, because appliances depreciate very fast as soon as you take the ownership. You may have economic risk, in fact, into other product categories which are more mundane because you wasted money. Then the next one is a social risk, that it is basically something where the, if you consume that product, your reference groups will avoid you in some fashion. So we look at those kinds of risks as the definition of what is called psychological acceptability from a customer viewpoint. So what we have done so far is to define each of the four A's, each one into two dimensions. Awareness into primarily brand knowledge and product knowledge accessibility into availability and convenience, affordability into, in fact, ability to pay and willingness to pay, and acceptability into functional acceptability and psychological or social acceptability. Let's show you something more now, which I think is very interesting. In my analysis here, I find very fascinating that if I plot each one of these two-dimensional A, you know, for each A, the two-dimensional map now, something strikingly comes out as huge opportunity for marketing to create value for customers. For example, in the awareness, most companies primarily talk about the brand, brand attribute, what's a unique selling proposition. In fact, Best commercials that I've seen are the commercials that talk about nothing except the brand overall image or brand associated with one word, primarily say prestige, primarily say performance or something like that, but no detailed information or a cognitive attribute information. But let's say brand and knowledge we know how to create because that's the role of the ad agencies, that's the role of the company's marketing managers. But would you believe most consumers or most customers don't have product knowledge? They don't know anything about the product. 
Think about how great an opportunity if one can actually go into the upper right hand quadrant from the lower right. In some product categories, the market actually may be in the lower left where the consumer's brand awareness is low and product knowledge is also low. Brand knowledge is low and product knowledge is low. low. And there may be other situations where product knowledge is high, but the industry has not as yet used brand knowledge. For example, diamonds. Most people know everything about diamonds. The type of the diamond, the quality of the diamond, the color, the shape, all whatever we talk about, but there is no real branding in the diamond business except maybe De Beers. So there you have the branding opportunity. How do you create brand knowledge in the minds of the company, our customers, so that they can carry that as a holistic view in their mind so that brand evokes all of the product attributes or brand attributes by and large. So there's a lot of opportunity. I find fascinating that marketing dollars we have spent enormously in brand knowledge, but not enough in product knowledge. And we'll show you specifically how to create each one of these dimensions a higher and higher level through marketing effort. Same thing, if you look at accessibility, we have emphasized enormously on convenience, on things like 24-7, for example. We are open 24-7, 365. We have the call centers. All this stuff is great. But are we in as many locations, as many time zones as the customer would like us to be? I find the availability dimension actually is not as good. It is not as saturated in the marketplace. There are many, many places where customer is there and he would like to actually buy the product, but it is not available at that location. So you've done a significant job on time utility, but not necessarily location or a place utility by and large. So availability is a very key, and as I mentioned, availability is not only just having distribution system in place, but at that location is the product on the shelf. It is organized, merch, you know, merchandising is done in such a way that it's easy to grab the product, et cetera, et cetera. All of that stuff is what I call availability. And availability, again, we'll show you how companies can improve on availability. So again, marketing is dominating in one dimension in terms of creating value for customers and relatively weak on the other dimension. By the way, availability becomes the key issue, not convenience, in many of the emerging economies where access to the market, availability also becomes a very key issue, as I mentioned earlier, in bottom of the pyramid market, by and large. So we'll talk about all this stuff. Also, I just want to point out before I go on to the next chart, and namely that the real strength of Coca-Cola was availability. In the remotest jungles of the Amazon, the natives will offer you, if nothing else, a bottle of Coca-Cola. Think about that. That is the real core competence, not just the secret formula that we all relate Coca-Cola with. There are some companies that have really understood this game very well, it requires nothing more, nothing less than logistic systems and supply chain management. And nowadays, what we know in manufacturing can be duplicate in a retail environment is a very key thing, namely just-in-time supply functions. As the product is bought by the customers, can we, in fact, replace it very fast, especially with all the IT technologies? Inventory management is much easier today than ever before in advanced countries, but availability as a dimension is much more to be emphasized, and I'll give you some examples uh, more and more as we go into the future uh, discussion about this presentation. Uh, the next area has to do with affordability, my passionate area. Again, what we have done in marketing is really overemphasize willingness to pay. In fact, all marketing is all about willingness to pay. How can I motivate the customer to pay more price for my product by differentiating, by positioning, and all the stuff? And we are pretty good at that stuff. But we have not really looked at how do we satisfy the ability to pay dimension of affordability. It is also not just limited to emerging economies and the bottom of the uh, pyramid, uh, people who earn $1 or $2 of wages a day kind of a thing with no wealth or a balance sheet in their, in their portfolio, 
but we are talking about ability to pay as a major issue in all advanced countries because in advanced countries, especially in America, we also have the rise of the new poor. Today, as much as 12 to 13 percent of the American population cannot, uh, is below the official poverty level, cannot afford many, many necessities of life, such as automobile insurance, such as health care insurance, for example. You also have many disadvantaged consumers where they get financing, they have no credit cards, but the financing they get is like 100% interest rates annually. So there are issues like that that we need to understand how to manage. And again, we'll show you some uh, company or what companies are doing in this area. And the last area I want to talk about is acceptability. Again, marketing has done a great job about psychological acceptability. How do I link the product with this particular icon such as a show business personality, starting all the way 100 years ago almost with Lux brand name of soap, when we were just getting industrialized, where Lux was a complexion soap, and they always used, now for almost 100 years, I think the same campaign, still successful, namely that show business people of country of origin. So in India, you show the Indian movie stars. In America, you show the American movie stars. In Italy, you show the Italian movie stars. And that campaign has worked very well. You create a psychological acceptability by associating with a well-known personality that you identify. At one time, you would be the show business people. Other time are the sports personalities. Some places would be corporate CEOs, for example. Some places would be humanitarians, whoever they are. You link it that way. So most of the utility we have created has been surprisingly in associations. How do I associate my product? with this setting, how do I associate my product with this socioeconomic group? How do I associate my, my product with this individual personality endorsement? And how do I associate my product, in fact, with this particular emotional need or a want of a customer, like a fear, for example, or simplicity or something like that? Now, what we really need more and more is to look at functional acceptability. Are we able to deliver the quality of the product, the design of the product, the reliability of the product, the hard stuff actually to the level the customer would want or expect or actually, in fact, would be demanding more and more? And that's the f dimension. Again, you will see at the lower right, you are very good, but not at the uh, upper right, by and large. And again, it will vary by product category. I can do the plot of each product category, each company in the product category, as to who does very well on psychological acceptability and, on fact, on functional acceptability would be the key thing. What we want to do now is to go into discussing each one of the tactics companies has used to improve each one of the dimensions. Remember, in awareness, there are two dimensions, brand awareness and product awareness. Brand awareness can be done very simply now with we have CRMs, Customer Relationship Management Databases. We know quite a lot about the individual consumer customers, or we similarly know quite a lot about business customers at a department level, at a manager level, as well as at a company level. There are companies like Donnelly Marketing, for example, who has databases on every household probably as much as four or five hundred different pieces of information, including not only the typical socioeconomic demographics, but what type of a neighborhood they live in, what kind of a house they have, what magazines they read, what television programs they watch. We know quite a lot about consumers. And what one ends up doing is what is called target marketing or database marketing. We also know how to do a lot of promotions as a way of creating brand awareness. I create a promotional offer of some sort which increases awareness. In fact, some of the things that are very popular are offering these enormous prizes. You have seen these publishers clearing house doing that thing that you are identified through lottery system, one of those winners, and you win million dollars. So people actually give more information in the process, and people can be therefore informed about the brand that you are promoting. Brand awareness using promotional tactics is a very common thing we do in marketing. We also do a lot of brand awareness nowadays on point of sale merchandising and display. People are not just at the home, but they are away from home into public places like shopping centers, grocery stores, 
uh, mass merchandisers, retailers, etc. How do we reach them there through point of sale merchandising and display? And this is again a very common practice. Almost we have a scientific approach to doing these things. It may not be as great in a B2B market as opposed to consumer markets. So here is one place consumer marketing approaches can be transferred or utilized in a business to business marketing. The other side are more interesting. The fourth area is getting more exciting now with the knowledge of CRM, as I mentioned, namely that what are the customer touch points? So if you're a bank, the customer touch points are the website that your customer goes to, the call center they call up, for example. Actually, it goes to the branch that you go to, for example. If the branch is located into high traffic areas like a supermarket, you are there. Every place the customer touches, and customer, of course, biggest touch point is the product itself. Product is a major channel of making brand awareness, the physical product. Have we displayed our brand in a conspicuous way so it is constantly reminding the customer, giving him the positive expectations? I've done a lot of research, actually some consulting work here. I find fascinating industrial raw materials generally have never, never used their branding to show at the time of consumption of the product or purchase of the product, a consumer knows that that raw material is made by XYZ company. Company that does very well, obviously, is the most famous case called Intel Inside, right? Here is a chip that consumer does not see, but it is very critical part. And they came out with a very famous commercial made a very positive impact in creating the brand name for Intel. This is true, in fact, of many raw materials and ingredients that go into making a finished product, especially components. A company that I worked for was a company in a roofing business, Certain Teed was the name. And they began to learn that on every roof shingle, they could put a little logo that says, this is Certain Teed. There are many products 3M company makes which are like raw materials. Many products Armstrong makes, for example, in the lumber business by and large, which are pre-made plywood things. Just goes on and on. You can just imagine how many touch points are out there. So CRM does not talk about these additional touch points, which are mostly product as a touch point, which is the biggest touch point, in my view, as opposed to call centers, as opposed to, in fact, uh, a you know, branch of a, you know, a bank, for example, as opposed to the website. So how do we create customer touch points or use the touch points for brand awareness? Then there are, of course, consumer advocates. Consumers who are loyal, customers who are loyal, become actually your advocates. They talk about you. We call it word of mouth communication. And now this is becoming what was a very informal approach, pretty much done by consumers. Now marketers are learning how to harness this power in a positive way and use it for increasing their own brand awareness. So we'll again go into some details a little later on. But word of mouth is a very major approach to creating brand awareness and actually more effective approach because when somebody who I trust who is my friend, who is a family member, a relative, etc. I believe that when they communicate, it will be more legitimate. All of the, uh, you know, the deceptive aspects of uh, marketing would be going away in my mind is a typical worry that I have as a customer goes away. All the guards are gone essentially in the process and customer believes that if the message comes from a friend or somebody that they can trust, would be more a genuine message. And of course, marketing should use legitimate way of channeling the right word of mouth rather than abuse that channel, as it has happened recently in what is called buzz marketing. I'm opposed to buzz marketing because that is not true word of mouth communication. But word of mouth communication is a very powerful medium to create brand awareness. And of course, it doesn't cost you as much. Then you have, obviously, the famous customer clubs. The best way to create brand awareness is what I call Harley Davidson's, you know, a hog room. Harley owners group are a fanatically loyal people. They are more than a club. They are like a cult, in my view. And there are many, many products where the consumer bonds emotionally to a level where they become like a cult phenomenon. Surprisingly, I'm finding Starbucks experience in the minds of the people is like a cult phenomenon. 
people wake up and go in the morning to get the Starbucks. And this is not limited to the ordinary people who are out on the road, but more and more I find as I meet many of my CEO colleagues who are on the boards with me cannot live without a Starbucks coffee in the morning. That experience is important to them for whatever reason. They have their own affinity. This is also called affinity marketing in some fashion again. You have companies like USAA in insurance business, affinity marketing. You have AARP group, affinity marketing. These are the association of, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, American Association of Retired Persons, AARP. That's basically the aging population into a cohort created by AARP as a membership group. Any of the membership groups are basically customer clubs. I find fascinating while we have some excellent examples like Harley Davidson, or Starbucks, which are sort of the icon, surprisingly this membership by common experience of consuming product is very, very common across mundane products. I'm told city by city there are Honda buyer groups, people who buy Honda and they get together to talk about Honda as an automobile, which is interesting. So this can be implemented into even the more mainstream mundane products. It does not have to be exciting products, by and large. It can be done around any product category, is my view. So the top three are more commonly used. The bottom three are the newer ways of creating brand awareness. Let's talk about improving product knowledge. Remember, this is the second dimension of the first A called awareness. The best mechanism, again, that traditionally we have used to create product knowledge has been publicity. Publicity is a news release, getting on, in fact, the editorial pages of magazines, getting on uh, news uh, programs of television, and nowadays a little more of that publicity goes into infomercials, you might have seen that thing, which is a paid commercial in some fashion, but it is done more in an educational format. News releases, as I mentioned, Web-based information is the next major wave. And as you know, more and more consumer customers, of course, B2B customers are doing it also, but consumer customers are first going to the website, doing the Google search, as we call it nowadays, and identifying in the process information about the product before they go shopping about the product. I'm told as much as 70% of the customers today go to the website first, to download the information about the automobiles that they are considering to buy before they go to the dealer. And this information is available, easily accessible. So I do believe that web-based information is going to be one major tidal wave of increasing the product knowledge. And of course, web-based has many, many varieties, such as the blogs on the one hand, a lot of non-profit organization, consumer advocacy people educating the consumers, for example, especially in healthcare, I'm finding a lot of information is just available for each of the chronic diseases, etc. And consumers are getting very much educated about the product category, not just the brand by and large. The newer areas that are emerging are educational seminars. Infomercials on the one hand, it is partly educational, partly selling. But nowadays, have you seen with aging of the population, all of the retirement things? I get invitation because I'm above the 65 mandatory retirement age in some fashion. And once I was absolutely a part of the social security system, I'm getting invited by all kinds of financial planning organizations to say, come and have a free dinner at some good restaurants, actually. And you get tempted, obviously, very interestingly. And you go and go out and hear about sort of the pitch they are giving, but it's a low key. Information is not about the company as much as about what you should do in retirement. How should you manage your uh, assets? How should you manage your uh, wealth preservation, as we call it by and large, kinds of phenomenon. And that's very interesting. Those workshops surprisingly have a lot of good content. And the last area that is happening more creatively, in fact, to create more product knowledge, not promoting the brand at all, Argument is that the more you make the customers aware about the product, you will convert more non-users into users or casual users into heavy users, no matter what brand they buy. And that is what I call community drive. More and more have you seen 
company volunteers engaging into all kinds of causes, running marathons. Uh, medical camps are very common nowadays. The doctors go out and do the community service. They are not selling anything. They are serving the public, but in the process, awareness of what they do, awareness of the disease, etc., arises. So the awareness of the product category rises in the process, and that's why all of these are very interesting things one can do. Marketing has tremendous power to do a positive way of contributing toward the customer by having a customer perspective as opposed to a product or a selling perspective by and large. Now we talk about, in fact, uh, improving the accessibility. And within accessibility, the first dimension is convenience. Obviously, as I mentioned earlier, we have done a great job on convenience, and the most common convenience platform now is 24-7, 365, primarily online. Online, I'm always available 24 hours, 7. For information, for any inquiry, in other words, I have a problem with my computer, send an email, there's a response that comes back, it's not symmetrical, and I have call centers, of course, on the other hand, and I can even do transaction today. If I wanted to buy today, I can buy. I'm told that 2005 Christmas probably would have a significant rise in online shopping for Christmas shopping, which is the biggest shopping season in America. Last two months, like November, December, is almost a frenzy because people find driving to the shopping center, fighting the crowds, parking, is just not as efficient, as not as convenient as online purchase. In fact, online purchase and even online gift giving, if possible. So I expect all of the department stores to offer those capabilities. Or one can go to online shopping places like, for example, Amazon, Amazon.com, or any of the other uh, book uh, sellers like Barnes and Nobles. Or you can go to Walmart online. You can go to any one of the large superstores or large department stores. So online is a very key. The other area that suddenly we discovered was at-home delivery. That makes it convenient. At-home delivery was always there in financial services, where the agent actually brought the policy to you. It is eventually, but he explains the policy or she explains the policy. Many financial services did come home, but today we find that products are delivered at home, and I call this as the domino pizza phenomenon. In fact, convenience has become so important because more and more advanced countries are time-driven rather than money-driven. Therefore, convenience, need for convenience rises in the process. People just don't have time to go out and get the products. If I bring it home, I call it the domino pizza phenomenon because if you guarantee that you will deliver within a half an hour of the promise that you have made, I'm willing to eat any food. Domino pizza is not the greatest pizza, please but it is acceptable, it is not necessarily outstanding. Same thing, cell phones. Because they're so convenient, I use it, in fact, anytime, anywhere, even though cell phone is not a reliable network, there are dead spots, as a noise, you know, the reliability, there's a quality of service, QoS, as it is called in telephone business, is far superior on the landline telephones. But I need access. In this case, convenience provides that access kind of a thing. Many or more and more, you see, customer premise services definitely is happening in the B2B market. Many travel agencies who have corporate accounts actually would have a travel desk, and they actually allow and encourage the, each department and a departmental secretary or executive assistant to download all of the, uh, you know, the, the information about the travel schedule travel tickets, for example, check-in boarding passes, and the airlines are doing the same thing now. Today, I can download my boarding pass, in fact, uh, within a couple of hours before I depart for the gate or go for the security by and large in most airports, pretty much. And the last area why I can increase this convenience is a more recent phenomenon in advanced countries because we now have this huge wealth as the driver of advanced countries, not income. So it's not monthly paycheck but it is my balance sheet. And many of the financial services are now going after what they call high net worth individuals. You have very large retail companies emerging, such as Charles Schwab on the one hand, Edward Jones on the other hand, 
AG Edwards, and they're all becoming retail financial services, which means that they align with high net worth person, a given dedicated person who is in charge, and he or she takes care of all of the bureaucracy of those large enterprises and all this complexity of services. American Express just spun out the subsidiary they had bought called IDS Life, which became actually, in fact, uh, you know, American financial advisors, and in the spin-off that just did, it's called Ameriprises or some such name, and obviously that's what you have are retail agents who are dedicated to account management, relationship management. And they inform you quite a lot about new products that are coming out, but they just make it convenient. They make it more and more convenient, and that's what this relationship managers is another opportunity that one can create in marketing. As I mentioned, convenience we know how to do quite well. What we need to do equally well is availability. Surprisingly, availability is not as good as we thought. Main point around here is that can we embed into existing infrastructure whatever we are offering, for example. Nowadays, you will see in high-rise elevators or lifts, as it is called in the uh, British vernacular, uh, vernacular, British language, uh, you will see now there will be a, a television set, basically, where you will get the CNN news, you will get information about stock market, you know, quotations, etc., because you have people in that infrastructure captive as an audience. All mass transit systems are the same way. More and more people are thinking that we will get more information, and in many product categories, I can actually do the order fulfillment, if necessary, on the airlines in the seat. Back of the seat, in fact, what you see is very clearly a flat panel, and that flat panel becomes my transaction mode. I can do online shopping there, and the product will be delivered at home, or I can pick it up at the airport when I land. Things like that are just happening more and more, and I find fascinating. By the way, one major embedding capability that is emerging, never we thought was possible, is the cell phone. World has already has crossed one billion cell phone subscribers. The next one billion will come in seven years or five years is the forecast. It is growing at that rate, 250 million new subscribers. Each cell phone now becomes my infrastructure where I can embed lots of information. I can embed a lot of transactions. And products that are digitized, such as, for example, financial services products, banking products, insurance products, uh, products like travel, hospitality, I can embed. And the cellular phone today, as it is going toward the next generation of architecture, clearly is not only a cell phone, just voice capability, but it is truly a multimedia capability. In fact, South Korea leads this revolution, and the South Korean local telephone company called KP, or KT, I think, Korea Telecom, KT, is fascinating. They are coming out with no next generation of vision about what its capabilities are there, which is not just dreaming, it is doable next day. And there you have a handheld device which is truly multimedia like a PlayStation 2, 16 by 9 aspect. It is now capable of bringing full uh, motion video communication. I can today bring, even in 2.5G as it is called, let alone a 3G, which is a fully broadband live television programs on my handset. And through those programs, I can now have all of the content that comes in and all of the commercials that go into that content. For example, in America, one of the wireless cellular telephone companies called Sprint just announced that they would have a joint marketing program between five major cable operators and a cellular company, Sprint, where all of the cable content will be coming not only just in the home on your television, but also on your cell phone, wherever you are, on a real time. So this goes beyond just the broadcast information. Well, if I can do that thing, there are companies who are now a, enabling the cell phone by embedding technologies like software or chips, for example, where my cell phone becomes my vending machine or my credit card machine. 
I, I can go in front of a vending machine. I'm told Coca-Cola company is wiring its vending machines in many countries, especially in Japan, where they have more than one million vending machines. How can you network that vending machine and my cell phone becomes my money payment system? So you abolish whole coinage. Coins are very expensive to collect, to put inside. A lot of fraud takes place in the process. In laundromats or in vending machines, wherever you see the vending machines, that's an enormous physical infrastructure which we have just begun to tap. Cell phone is another enormous physical infrastructure or an information infrastructure that we can go in. Just goes on and on. You just, your imagination now can run wild with this just understanding, right? And by the way, in many, many of the poor countries in rural markets, there are other physical embedded places. People have used, in fact, in many of these countries, would you believe, the local police stations, local healthcare centers, to create a hubbing mechanism for all of the services. The massive presence in rural markets anywhere in the world, including emerging nations or advanced countries, is a one distribution system called the postal service, postal unions. They're everywhere. I've never seen a deeper system in the world than the postal system. Well, postal systems can carry more than mail. Postal systems can become collection points more than mail. And in fact, I'm working with one of the very large companies that puts meters out there. We have seen many of the meters, you know, and going into emerging nations to say, can we make that meter devised in such a way that it becomes actually a, a rural, portable almost, a transaction machine, just like a swiping the card that we have in most of the retail stores in metro areas. And of course, now wireless technology comes in, so remotest part of the country, you don't have the wire anymore. You simply use cellular or more satellite technologies. So there's a huge possibility that's happening out there to expand the availability as much as possible. Of course, the more mundane things we talk about are multiple channels. In other words, we can have, as I mentioned earlier, different access points. So a customer can go any way it wants to. At one time, we had this debate about the, you know, the, the, the brick and uh, mortar on the one hand and click and a mouse on the other hand. And the answer is it's both. It's not one or the other, please. The retailing is what I call a pizza industry. In pizza industry, as you know, I can have a dining experience if I want to. I can sit down, have a good, enjoyable meal with my family, friends. I can have a takeout by just calling and ordering the pizza, or I can have a delivery at home. And that's the hybrid of all shopping that's going to take place. All buying will take place that way. So we call it brick and a click, or click and a mortar, or whatever you call it. It's a hybrid combination. Any way, any time, anywhere customer wants to buy, I'm available. I'm accessible. That's the availability. Just to give you the size of this one again, how much customers are shifting in advanced countries. As you know, in the US, more and more women are working outside the family out of sheer necessity. So today, if you take adult women 18 and above age, more than 55% are working outside the family. 75% of women with children in their home, which are relatively younger women, are working outside the family. And the next generation of young women think about working 100% almost outside the family. Very few women want to say, as soon as I graduate from college or high school, I want to be a homemaker. That's a very rare phenomenon. And therefore, they have no time. There's a time shortage and a time shift. Monday through Friday, 8 to 5, they're all busy working. Then weekends and evenings get very crowded with so many other activities. So here is a phenomenon that is emerging. A company called Legs Pantyhose shifted the distribution enormously because pantyhose, pantyhose used to be only a social occasional wear when women went out as homemakers for an evening, uh, evening enjoyment with their husbands, maybe in a social setting of some sort. It was distributed through department stores. The frequency of purchase was low in the process because it's an occasional wear. 
But as women began to work outside the family, it became a daily necessity. And therefore, Lex Pantyhose people were very smart, first of all, to package it right, so it made it very at psychologically attractive acceptability, improve the quality, so the functional acceptability also went up. But the biggest thing they did was to shift the distribution from department stores to the neighborhood grocery stores. They thought they were doing convenience by having better access. But today, I'm told, 60% of women who are loyal buyers of Lex Pantyhose have no time to go to the neighborhood grocery store even. So guess what they do? Late at night, they fill out the form, mail it out, or late at night, they go online and place the order for pantyhose, and the pantyhose comes at home, delivered at home. That's availability and convenience put together, for example. Also, another way to create more access, physical access, availability, is to co-locate in high traffic areas. For example, we have seen more and more banks being located in supermarkets, or in shopping centers, or even in corporate offices. Just tip of the iceberg. Think about how many things we can go. The best place I've seen more merchandise ever coming together into one high traffic location is the airport. If you go to Heathrow Airport, which led the revolution, if you go to Chicago O'Hare Airport, that is another major one, you see more looking like them being merchandise marts. Space is less and less for the gates and sitting, and more and more, in fact, for selling everything there imaginable. You sell a high-priced jewelry. You have all of the uh, quick service restaurants, for example. You have sit-down dining experience. You can get all of the merchandise like, you know, sports things. It's basically a mega mart. If you analyze the things, the number of stores, types of merchandise, it's even bigger than a typical supermarket. It is bigger than a typical superstore. In fact, in Europe, quite a few of the airports have 24-7 grocery stores where the local people come to the airport to shop because airport rent seems to be cheaper for whatever reason than the neighborhood uh, rent for building a, a typical grocery store by and large. I, I find very fascinating how people go for their milk and their bread and their detergents to their airport. Of course, this is in a non-security area where outside traffic and inside traffic would be mingled together, interestingly. And more recently, more and more people have learned to increase their access availability is to align with channel partners. For example, Schwab has decided that they are a great retailer, and as a retailer, they're allowing access to many of the financial products designed and created, such as mutual funds, for example, or even hedge funds, for example, et cetera, by other companies who are producers of those, and channel uh, Schwab is the retailer. And, of course, many airlines are creating airline code sharing, which also, in fact, creates huge channel partners. So I get more availability of flying into different cities, not just the airline that I prefer. So if you are in the Star Alliance and you are United Airlines, you have access to Lufthansa seats. You have access, in fact, to on the, on the, on the, west, on the, on the, on the far east to Singapore Airlines, for example. Cathay Pacific just goes on. Similarly, if you are, in fact, One World Alliance, it is Qantas on the one hand in Australia, it is British Airways in, you know, the European market, and, of course, it is American Airlines here. And Delta, third major carrier, has its own Sky Team, which is aligned with Air France. It is aligned, of course, with KLM, and uh, Korea Air on the Asia side, as well as in the U.S. with Continental Airlines and Northwest Airlines. So it's a very really large set of alignment partnering code sharing that allows you more access as to when you want to fly, where you want to fly, making it possible. That's what availability is all about, right? Now we go to the next area, which has to do with willingness to pay. And willingness to pay is more what we have done traditionally, as I mentioned earlier. We know how to package products in a way it makes them more exciting. In fact, this is where I think America excels. Europeans have been just wonderful at this game also. Look at the perfume. It is not the perfume, but the package that makes the difference. Look at many product categories like that, where packaging, like in chocolates, in gift giving, makes all the difference. So we have created willingness to pay 
not because of the product strength, but value add packaging strength. Positioning we do very well. We position products to say this is a product for price. If you're looking for low price, this is the product. This is the product for prestige. <clears throat> this is the product for value. There are three segments always in the marketplace. People buy product for its prestige value or buy product for its economic value, which is called the value segment, or people buy because they want cheap price of some sort by and large, and different products. So one positioning is the second major thing, which this is a marketing 101. We have done this again and again, and we are very good at this skill set. Targeting is another one, which is really psychographic and demographic targeting. Targeting to a particular lifestyle segment, for example. Are you hormone the retiring homebody, for example? Or are you some other lifestyle human being? And can I target, because I know all your other activities, interest, and uh, opinions that you have, and I embed my product into those to increase the willingness of my product in your mind. That's basically targeting. And of course, the demographic targeting is very traditional age cohorts, teenager, young adults, women, uh, you know, the, the gender cohorts, for example, ethnic cohorts, for example, genetic cohorts, you know, just goes on. We have studied that quite a lot, income, education, occupation, all this stuff, by and large. More interesting area we are learning how to do willingness to pay increase is what is called bundling. The telephone companies have done a great job where you bundle different products and services but put it into one price package. This is slightly different than one-stop shop, which the banks have done very well. You can do one-stop shop where you have multiple products offered together in some fashion, promoted together in some fashion, and in the process, willingness to pay goes up. It is called a cross-sell or upsell. Those are the kinds of buzzwords that we all use in marketing. So bundling, however, is my favorite in the sense that it shows you that people are looking at the marginal value they get for one more product or a function or a feature versus marginal price they pay. And in the, pri in the, pri in the, in the process, the total package value goes up in their mind, and therefore they're more willing to pay. So willingness to pay comes from this price value equation in their mind. Perceived price value, therefore, is my second comment. We look at vacations from that viewpoint, and there are many, many resorts who come out with packages. Airlines come out with tour vacation packages, for example. Conferences always are organized around saying that you come not only for the conference, but you will get a value package. If you want to do some tourism sightseeing, we bundle that as a part of your conference. And of course, in many conferences, people like us go there because we don't pay. Actually, we are just users. The payment is done by my company. Payment is done by my university, etc. So when you separate the payroll from a user role, this becomes even more interesting. One additional tactic we have all used as a willingness to pay is to create additional value-add service, which is exclusive things where we say because it's exclusive, it segments out most of the people, and those are the airline lounges. You know, airline lounges were free services at one time. That's my memory. I could get a lifetime airline lounge for companies like Pan Am, which is out of business, but Delta owns them, so all those uh, valuable uh, lifelong club services, I still am eligible. United Airlines, red carpet club. I would pay $100, and I would have a lifelong access to those things. Today, they're charging more than $100 a year because airline lounges provide tremendous additional value in between flight connections, especially now we have this huge hubbing uh, phenomenon, and especially when we're doing the international flights. So given all this stuff, exclusivity as a phenomenon is another way to create willingness to pay. Exclusive brand, like a designer brand, exclusive airline clubs, for example, where you have, a, you have to pay, and in therefore your willingness to pay comes in, and of course the gated communities. Gated communities phenomenon began to arise, not as much on the security principle as saying access to the golfing or boating, etc., would be done where all the people who show up in that gated community would be comparable to your cohorts by and large. So you're beginning, beginning to really create a cohort of some sort. So I think we have done that very, very well in as a part of willingness to pay. 
one can also increase the willingness to pay by doing more value-add services. Think about Foot Locker as a retail store. They just don't sell Nike. They add a value on that Nike and increase the willingness of Nike as a product, and they add value by service and selection. You can get any shape size of Nike that you want, Nike-like products like Adidas and you know New Balance and all those guys that we think about. But also you see the person there in charge, the sales clerk, by the way, is not just an ordinary order taker, he's a specialist. Actually, in fact, you have to be active in two sports to qualify as a sales clerk. Most of them are athletes, Olympic aspirants, and the athlete coaches of those high schools and colleges work at Foot Locker in the evenings and weekends. They know exactly how the product works as users themselves, have huge credibility. Have you seen at Foot Locker, they'll have this referee uniform that says, I'm the expert. So expertise is value add. Foot Locker is sort of a simple example, but better examples are expertise added in financial services, where you have the CFA giving you a lot of advice. Most people are not that good. Same thing value add done in medical services the same way, where the customers as patients are not really that knowledgeable. So I can do a lot of value add services. And as I mentioned, full uh, service brokers are in that category by and large. You know? And then the last way to create willingness to pay, and these are just some examples. There are many more tactics out there. My interest here is not to give you the uh, complete encyclopedia of marketing practices. This is not a handbook of marketing practice. This is really to go and show here is a framework for A's of marketing that can be used very, very well with our traditional tools and techniques that we know. And the last one, therefore, is what we call a razor and a blade principle. This one was invented by Kodak. If the cost of camera is going to be very high, you have a derived demand film, more people will not be able to buy. Affordability was an issue, so they deliberately went into making the cameras. The first one was called Hawkeye, point and shoot cameras, made it so affordable that more people will come as from non-users to users, and the more you have users, the more they'll make the, uh, they take the pictures. Make it very simple. Today's concept about simplicity we'll talk about when it comes to acceptability, functional acceptability, was really invented by Kodak way back when. Master at this game. And they knew that over the lifetime of a customer, the film usage and the higher price of the film will justify almost giving away the camera at no prices, I mean at low prices or, or low margins. Similarly, Blade and a razor principle, Gillette created the same concept that I can give away the razor so that you can buy the blade that fits into that one and over the life cycle margin, the profitability of that blade, I can calculate how much razor I can give away free or subsidized. And of course the master at this game are a sheer accident, a company or industry that figured out has been the cellular industry. You know that earlier the cellular telephone was an installed thing in the automobile. It was anchored as an automobile accessory costing $3,000. Nobody would have bought that thing. That is why the cellular industry forecast in 85, 84 was that even in the year 2000 in America, there will be less than 800,000 subscribers because they all thought cellular industry will be an accessory in the automobile. Motorola created a revolution by making cell phone a handheld device. Microtac was the first major breakthrough they came out. In a small miniature phone, you had the quality of a telephone, especially a digital telephone. So when the world went from analog to digital in cell technologies, it revolutionized the whole thing. But the cost was still high, $400, $500, etc. So the cellular telephone companies, the service operators decided, we will give the cell phone free if you actually, in fact, subscribe to the service, a contract for one year or two years. Again, the same as a razor and a blade principle, a, you know, camera and a film business, the same thing. And cell phone industry today, as you know, is almost a virtual necessity. Today, all the people who never thought they had ever need for a cell phone, once they have it, they cannot live without a cell phone. And of course, the next generation is beginning with a cell phone because access point affordability is so cheap 
and therefore willingness to pay is created by creating this bundling or subsidizing in this case between the set versus the service by and large. You know, as I mentioned, willingness to pay is fine. We should give all these examples, how companies have done very well, what marketing practices we have used. I am, however, very serious about making sure that we also contribute to our ability to pay. How do we manage this bottom of the pyramid customers and create new market opportunities for existing products in some fashion? And there are, again, many tactics companies have used to uh, minimize or to somehow accommodate or to overcome ability to pay of customers in the marketplace. Again, we'll take these examples mostly from household consumer markets, although same things are possible in a business-to-business -business marketing environment. Uh, the first one is buy versus lease. Actually, the whole lease phenomenon began in Europe in England especially, it's called higher purchase, which means that you are renting it and use the product until the value of the product is such that now you can able, you are able to afford to pay for the product. It's called higher purchase, which is slightly different than our leasing concept today that we have created. So buy versus lease is a common platform. It began in a business to business market with companies like Xerox who figured out that actually leasing will reduce the capital cost. It becomes the operating OPEX, as it is called, operating expense, as opposed to CAPEX or capital expense. And many companies' budgeting processes are different, so the ability to buy was blocked. Willingness to pay was there, but ability to buy was blocked because there was no capital dollar. But they had operating dollars. And therefore, they went into more lease to a level where government actually mandated that they must sell if the customer wants to buy. So leasing has become very common in office equipment, for example. Leasing has become very common. Do you know that today in all aircraft, airlines do not buy planes anymore. They lease planes from two large leasing companies who buy planes from the Boeing and the Airbus of the world. One is, of course, is GE Capital, and the other one is an Irish company located in New York in some fashion, and they are the two largest wholesale lease companies on aircraft. I'm told that now even the military of the government is leasing their military aircraft. Think about that, because they don't have any more capital dollars, deficit budget, whatever the reasons are kind of a thing. And, of course, leasing has become a popular thing now in the automobile industry. Now you get, in fact, an automobile. You can buy it or you can lease it. So leasing allows people who don't have that capital dollar up front to pay, let's say $30,000, $40,000 for a car. And of course, we have done the same thing in financing with homes, mortgage. In fact, this country was built on that by creating a whole separate institution called savings and loan, where people's savings will be allocated. And they were allowed primarily to finance homes so that more consumers can afford to buy their home than be just the renters, which is why the home ownership in America is absolutely in a very different scale than the rest of the world. Today, more than 65% of the American households own their home rather than rent, whereas in the rest of the world, the numbers may be just the reverse kind of a thing. So we have done quite a lot in financing on the business side, what's called infrastructure financing, financing highways, financing ports, financing airports, just goes on and on. So financing is a second major uh, thing we, we can organize or create in terms of ability to pay. These are standard things we have done. Third party payer is a very unique situation where you say separate the role from a user to a payer. If the user has the need, but does not have the money to pay, is there somebody else who can pay? And that is how, by the way, the healthcare insurance business came into existence. It is a very recent phenomenon, I'm told, only after the Great Depression. Before then, people paid out of their pocket for their medical service. People had no money, therefore they stopped going to the doctors. Doctors had no business, so they decided they will actually create an organization which we call Blue Cross Blue Shield today, which turned out to be actually an insurance plan. 
The idea was that if people can contribute a little money, then the total amount of money provides sufficient financing for doctors to continue their job, private practice in this case, and Blue Cross Blue Shield then began to appeal to large corporations, government agencies, uh, universities, for example, and motivate them to go for a life insurance, I mean health insurance plan, so that people's health care needs could be taken care with the logic that a healthy employee is more beneficial, more productive to the corporation. And that's how the health care insurance began, for example. And it is being now used more and more worldwide. We have a similar thing where the key person in an organization, he or she is so critical, let's say the CEO or the C chief operating officer or CFO, and many companies actually now buy the life insurance of that person so that in case that person dies, the benefit comes to the corporation as a way of somehow managing the transition in the process. The insured does not pay again in the same case. The user does not pay, but it is somebody else pays, right? We have done similarly ability to pay by creating product variety. For example, Sears was masters at this game during its early days, heydays, by creating under a Sears brand name its own good, better, best quality, three quality levels. Fundamental quality will be there, but all the value add things, functions, features will vary. So you have a good, better, best clothing, for example, good, better, best appliances, for example, good, better, best craftsman tools, for example, or lawnmowers, and they did a fantastic job, in fact, by creating and modern version of the same thing we have seen is Marriott hotels have done. Marriott became too expensive, so they came out with a concept called Courtyard by Marriott, which has been a value proposition. Marriott is a prestige or a premium, and they've come out with another brand name called Hampton Inn. And therefore, you now have the same thing. At the good level is Hampton Inn. At a better level is Courtyard by Marriott. At the best level is Marriott, for example. More recently, a significant shift has been made by companies like IBM. It is like on-demand computing. It says you don't have to invest in your computing capacity in a company. Multi-million dollar investment in either the mainframe computers or more like super servers that we have now. And those infrastructure costs are capital cost. You don't do anything. If you have any need, just call us and we can give you on-demand computing, which means IBM actually finances the capital investment. You are just buying the service. You are not leasing, which is a different concept, but this is a concept where you never own anything. You are simply a user rather than an owner. Very important thing. This is also what we do in electricity or utilities, telephone, electricity. We really don't own the service. Nowadays, we own the instrument. At one time, we did not even own the instrument. The telephone company leased you the telephone set for your use, but today, of course, we can own the instrument, but not the service, for example. That also is often called right to use rather than right to buy. By simply thinking from right to buy to a new concept called right to use, you can make lots of people immediately affording uh, having the ability to pay for the product by and large because payment is usage payment as opposed to ownership payment by and large. More recent and especially in emerging nations are the following mechanisms which have been created to increase the ability to pay. Uh, the first one has been called micro packaging. So in other words, the unit price of the product is dropped enormously by putting that into small package. So for example, why should a consumer buy and, and, and hold the money for a shampoo that will last you one month? Why not make the shampoo in a sachet so that it is one package for one use only? And at that level, the cost drops so much that even the poor rural Indian farmers can afford to buy shampoo. They otherwise use some other alternative things like soaps to wash their hair. In India, lots of these packaging differences have been made to make it more affordable. For example, Chiclet's gum by Warner Lambert in those days, when they offered it first time eight units in a box, price was too high, 
Also, in fact, in a hot, humid climate year around, you don't eat all eight pieces together. You eat one or two pieces. You could not store it back. It all becomes, melt, it melts down. So they came out with a very interesting uh, uh, concept because after they failed, they figured out why they failed and began to pack the total thing into units of two, each one cellophane wrapped. Unit price drops. Of course, the climatic conditions are managed, and the product took off. Lots and lots of examples of how with packaging changes, packaging innovations, one can make ability to pay. Again, in India, people can't afford a whole package of cigarettes, 20 sticks. So you always have a market where people buy one stick at a time. Again, the unit cost drops down enormously, right? Microfinancing is the other major activity that has emerged. Again, these are all NGO-initiated activities, quite often non-profit organizations, which are now becoming commercial viability. So what you do is that you finance people at very small amounts of money. And those finances are done primarily, in fact, in countries like India and in China, you have the traditional pre-banking days institutions that were organized where it's like a banking principle, but where a local community, a group of families agree that they will monthly save money, put it into a pot, and that pot will be given out once a month to each different family. It's just like what banks do. Banks collect money as deposits from so many people, and they know at a point in time, probably 10% of that money will be used by some people who are depositors as lenders for the same money. Same concept was there. In India, it's called the CHIT system, C-H-I-T, and it's a massive, multi-billion dollar financing system, all unorganized, all mom and pop, et cetera, and that's what is microfinancing. In fact, microfinancing has become also a venture capital phenomenon to create social entrepreneurs, economic entrepreneurs, out of the rural illiterate population quite a lot. And the whole phenomenon that I've been talking about called bottom of the pyramid uh, it has a number of recommendations about how to make affordability arise in the nation by designing products in a way that they can be much more affordable, for example. While a typical cell phone may be 100 to $120 in price at the retail market, which is subsidized by cell phone companies, but now cell phone manufacturers are designing products, and I'm told they'll be designing one cell phone pretty soon in year 2006. It'll be commercialized at, would you believe, $20 retail price. Same thing. There is a, and this will be manufactured by traditional people like Nokia, Motorola, etc. In fact, the GSM consortium has mandated that if you want to be a GSM supplier, you must actually come out with products at about $40, $45. That's much more affordable than $120, you see. If you go down to $20 level, it is mass market capability now. Anybody can afford it, kind of a notion. More interestingly, a company in India called Reliance has used an alternate wireless technology by simply redefining the definition of a license away from a cellular spectrum to any technology, technology agnostic, and they've come out with a WLL, wireless local loop, which extends the range to six, seven, eight kilometers. And then you connect to a cellular network or a hardwired network, typically landline. It's called a CDMA, WLL CDMA architecture. And they can make the total service even more affordable. So it is possible to think about new ways of innovating, not just new way of financing packaging that we talked about, to really create the mass market among the bottom of the pyramid kinds of markets out there which are still untapped and have not experienced the benefit of modern day technology and industrial revolution by and large. That's all about ability to pay.